Welcome back, everyone, to Clearly Aligned Podcast. I'm Kelly Tyrrell here with founder Dr. Stephen Schulk. And as a special treat, our first ever guest, our friend and now Chief Growth Officer, Chris Sito. So welcome, guys. Thanks, Kelly. Okay. Sorry. Today, we're going to be speaking about business conversations because these two guys are the experts at uh, business and efficiency. So I'm going to be a little quieter today. A nice treat for y'all. So yeah, so we've got Chris here, and so maybe we can um, introduce Chris, and we can hear a little bit about your background, Chris, and what brought you to um, our doorstep, which we're happy to have you, of course. Yeah, well, thanks thanks for having me on the podcast. I feel excited to be one of the, the first guests. Am I the first guest? If yeah. you're the Number one. <laughs> you're first. It's excellent. Um, so, I, you know, I'll tell you, I guess... I, a little bit about myself, I guess, first and foremost, I'm a husband, I'm a father, I have a beautiful wife and three amazing children, uh, ranging from the ages of almost 22 to, to 15. So quite a range there. They're a bit older, so a little older than the, than Steven's uh, little kiddo and uh, kind of in the same range as, as Kelly's kids. So, uh, you know, we have something in common there. But, uh, you know, as far as work goes, I'm really excited to be over working with Clearly Aligned with uh, Dr. Schalk and with Kelly uh, as of the beginning of September. So a little background on myself. Um, you know, I guess I, in my career after university, I started out in education. I was a school teacher for about five years, then uh, left teaching to move into the wonderful world of sales. Uh, and I've been in sales for over 23 years now. So I moved uh, over to a company, a small company called Pfizer. Uh, which I, I worked for for quite a few years and then made my way through a number of different pharmaceutical companies uh, in multiple positions in sales and marketing. And just uh, uh, and just jumping in for a second here, Chris, yeah. <laughs> just because I always find this very interesting. Yeah. What, what grade were you teaching? Let's, let's uh, dive in teaching, a little bit here. Uh, for our Canadians, I was teaching junior high. For our Americans, it was middle school. So grades seven, eight, and nine. So I guess the, the thing that blows me away is the kids that I taught in my first year of teaching, I was only 22 when I started teaching. Um, they're now, I think, in almost 40. <laughs> yeah, they would be 39 and 40, the kids that were in grade nine that I was I was teaching. So wow. Um, got Zoom has this this thing that is, know, is it bad that my my first reaction was you're old? No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm feeling that. I'm feeling that. But yeah, so I taught middle school science and uh, and phys ed uh, for five years before I, I moved into sales. And, and were you like the phys ed my... were you like the phys ed teacher who was forced to teach science? Like you know when you had that like I remember ours at our high school who like had no idea what he was doing. Or were you like the science teacher who was forced to teach phys ed or was it a combo of both? Are you uh, smart in it or both or one or the other? <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, funny story <laughs> is um, when I got my job in Edmonton Public, because I'm, I'm living in Edmonton still and I did my teaching in Edmonton, I was one of two new grads to get a job in Edmonton Public because there was really very few teaching jobs. So you just took whatever you could get. Uh, and I actually didn't get a job until three weeks into the school year uh, because the classes that that I ended up having put two teachers out on stress leave in the first three weeks. So when I got hired, uh, the principal looked at me and goes, well, you look young. You don't look you look a little young and dumb. Uh, you probably be willing to take this on. Uh, and so it was it was probably the, it was brutal. Uh, but I made it through. But I was a phys ed teacher that was actually not forced to teach science because I always liked science. It was more I was forced to teach social studies. And that was one of those things where it was like, you can't you know, tell the kids you can't read ahead because I was reading, <laughs> and learning the material that was 84. So, uh, yeah, so that was an interesting experience for sure. But, yeah, that's uh, quite the so right from the very beginning of your career, you pretty much had to jump across all these different, uh, <clears throat> I guess, uh, spectrums because that's pretty hard to teach phys ed, science, and social studies. Yeah. 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 It's pretty typical for, which is not the way yeah. it should be for, for new teachers to kind of get the dog's breakfast of a yeah. schedule a lot of times because the, you know, the veteran teachers, they eventually get to where the courses they want to teach and all the stuff that's left over gets handed off to the, the new young, vibrant teacher that they think they can handle it so mm -hmm. uh so yeah it was an interesting first year made it through ended up being department of phys ed uh, department head of phys ed uh, before i left and uh, took took on the 
the sales role in the pharmaceutical industry. And so hang spend- on, hang on again. You're, you're going too quick here, Chris. <laughs> you got to remember this is podcast format. This is fireside oh chat. God, this podcast is going, uh, it'll it's be, like, it's going to be three hours. That are interesting to us. And we're, yeah, yeah, down, yeah. Right? So we're, we're long format here. We take our time. Yeah, okay, okay, <clears throat> we've we've okay. got, I've got 30 years of this ahead of me. And so, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we'll have you in. A, I don't, I don't, you just heard <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so what, what drove that change? I've, I've heard this before, but so you're a phys ed teacher. How does a one fit at phys ed teacher go from, from that? And then all of a sudden you're in pharma. The great yeah. eight girls. That's what drove it. <laughs> yeah. No, <laughs> that's to wrestle into gym. <laughs> yeah, that's not untrue. Those, those two great, eight, it was two grade eight classes that put the teachers out in stress leave and it wasn't the boys <laughs> that caused the problems. I'll tell you that. <laughs> But yeah, my transition from teaching into sales, I've always uh, enjoyed, you know, sales and connecting with people and and talking to people. I'm fairly outgoing, I guess. Um, and I had some friends that were in the pharmaceutical industry and uh, had no idea what pharmaceutical sales was. I'd never really heard about it at that point. You remember, this is almost 25 years ago. And um uh, I, I remember seeing a friend at, at, I played volleyball with and he came back from some meeting in Miami and he was all tanned in the middle of the winter. And I'm like, what do you do? He goes, oh, I'm in pharmaceutical sales. And uh, I said, well, what is that? You know, who do you sell to? Uh, and it turns out I thought it was only pharmacists, but it's predominantly medical doctors. And so I, I decided to go on a little ride along with him. And and, uh, and I don't want to throw pharmaceutical sales reps under the bus here, but uh, we we met, had coffee, saw a doctor for 15 minutes uh, with, on a set appointment. Then we had lunch with another doctor and then had an appointment in the afternoon at three o'clock. And then at the end of the day, uh, he looked at me and he goes, Whoo, that was a busy day. <laughs> and I looked at him and I said, where do I sign up? Because I was being governed by bells from eight in the morning till 3.30 and dealing with, you know, teenage kids on a regular basis. So uh, it was very interesting to me at that point. Now, going back and looking at it, to have three booked appointments in a day is actually quite busy, right? Uh, you know, in the pharmaceutical industry, a lot of times you're running around to clinic after clinic. And and uh, so so that was kind of what spurred me on to, to, to start applying for jobs in the pharma industry. But also going back to teaching, it was, I, I love the kids that I taught that were really good. Um, but obviously there's teenage kids in junior high that, um, don't really want to learn. And I wasn't the teacher that was going the extra mile to make sure these, these kids were, you know, getting as much education as as they could. So I knew from that perspective that maybe teaching wasn't going to be my, you know, long-term career, but it gave me a lot of skill sets in terms of presentation skills and such to, to transfer into the sales industry, which I came into and ended up loving. Um, so spent 18 years in pharma, you know, worked for companies like Pfizer, uh, Shearing Plow, Merck. <clears throat> Merck was my last company that I spent 10 years with. And then um, <clears throat> made the big jump to uh, to orthodontics and dental uh, back in early, to the end of 2017. So, so it hasn't been a tremendously long time, but it feels much, much oh, longer than, uh, than what awesome. it actually yeah. Um, and <laughs> yeah, <it does. laughs> so I ended up uh, moving over to Align Technology and working for Invisalign for a number of years. And uh, and that's kind of where I met both of you uh, way back when. So Stephen, uh, you know, I was your TM. Yeah, I, f- uh, I feel like we should give some context to that because yeah. Uh, yeah. it's such a good story. <clears throat> so f- for those listening right now, um, yeah, I... Started my Invisalign journey back, maybe my orthodontic journey in 2016, my clear aligner journey in 2017. And I had just decided that I was going to dive headfirst into aligners. And my rep at the time uh, was a great guy named Jason Jobes. Jason is this like smooth talking, handsome, like silver yeah. fox. Like I hope he listens to this right now and is just yeah, I'll send it to him after this. He'll yeah. Do. Okay. Please do. I'll um, her as the only female. <laughs> He's the silver fox. And shout out to his wife, also fabulous. <laughs> and so I um, I really jump into aligners. And we go from zero cases to, actually, no, that's not right. That's wrong. In quad two or quad three, whatever it was, 
we had done uh, three cases. I did my first ever three cases in the quarter before. And then we went out and hit uh, 60 cases in the next quarter. So I'm from zero to 60. So anytime that a doctor does say that like, well, it's not possible to really grow or sometimes I get told like, oh, you really need to like dumb it down for doctors because they can't really hit that volume or that, um, I don't know, I guess also level of, of hopefully skill and competency. I'm kind of like, well, we went from zero to 60 in, in three months when you have the systems in place because it's all about the systems. And so Jason was my rep. And then I finished this quarter, we finished the year. And all of a sudden I find out that Jason has been promoted and he's gone. And instead I'm getting this new guy coming on board who, uh, who's, who's brand new named Chris Ito. And, uh, make it till you make it Chris. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I, I did. <laughs> and apparently I think Jason was still with me for a couple weeks or maybe I was without a rep, but I met Chris in, uh, in Vancouver at Pacific dental conference and so from Chris's side of the story, so I feel like you need to give, give your side and then I'll, I'll, uh, <laughs> well, I think you got to start out by first saying that, um, I received an email from Dr. Schalk, right. uh, when I first started. So Jason Job sent out a transition email saying, I'll be moving on and Chris will be taking my place. You're in good hands, even though he knows nothing about dental and he's never done anything with orthodontics in his life. Uh, but you're still in good hands. <laughs> you're like, thanks, uh, Jason. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, you didn't phrase it that way. But, um, uh, you know, Stephen sent me an email uh, saying, you know, I'm really excited to meet you. I've been doing great things with Jason. I'm looking forward to doing great things with you as well. And I, I almost fell out of my office chair because I don't think I've ever received an email from a doctor in my 18 years of pharma saying things like this. So it really actually got me pumped up and excited that I, I made this move because it was a big move moving from one industry to the next. Um, so thinking that, you know, oh, I'm going to have this great relationship with this guy. He's one of my top customers at that point. He just hit platinum, I think. And uh, he's going to PDC. And I, I happen to be at my very first conference, like a month into working at a line and email him, say, hey, I'll, I'm going to be at PDC. You want to grab dinner? You want to grab drink, coffee, whatever it is. And kind of ghosted me. <laughs> and, and, and we kind of ran into each other at the booth and he had introduced himself. He says, oh, I'm, I'm Dr. Schalk or I saw his badge. I'm like, oh, hey, Dr. Schalk, it's Chris. I'm your new TM. He's like, yeah, yeah. Okay, no, well, it wasn't hey. quite like that. It wasn't quite. What the background here is, is that my partner and I at our practice at PDC, we were on a, on kind of a mission at PDC, Pacific Dental Conference, for those who don't know. And so we were, we were needing to buy um, a few hundred thousand dollars worth of equipment. And so met Chris finally in person, but didn't really have time to chat. And I didn't kind of recognize who he was because um, he was mixed in with all the other Align reps as I was at the Align booth. And so I just find that so interesting looking back now at how oh, throwing Claire's toys around. Uh, if you heard that, so how, how an interaction with somebody can change your life so completely, because that was the first time that I met Chris in person and moving on from that, Chris was invited to our wedding. Um, I pretty much talked to Chris every single day for, I, don't know, I guess, three years. Um, and then finally being able to have Chris on board at clearly aligned and, and now obviously, um, playing huge roles in each other's lives again, just how, how monumental of a change that, that was. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm getting all sappy here, but <laughs> it, it was, it was just one of those things where you're like, wow, something that completely changes your life because, um, just jumping in, Chris then became my rep. And, and the thing that I think is so cool about the relationship that doctors have with their, their reps, especially at a line with Invisalign reps is they're truly a partner. Like, yeah. do you need to tell them a little bit about your, your wife, Colleen, and how we'd be texting back and forth and she'd be almost like asking you, is that, is that like another woman that you're texting right now? <laughs> yeah, it was, uh, yeah. Well, I think it was because we're both growing in our roles, right? And you were growing on your Invisalign journey. I was growing with my role at the line and, uh, and Stephen, I think was single at the very start of that and uh, living in the bachelor pad in Grand Prairie with all the associate dentists with their <laughs> ping pong table in the, in the dining room. Uh, so time was, was not what it is now, right? Obviously we're pulled in different yeah. directions and uh, we would 
constantly talk about orthodontics and, and, and Invisalign and the business of orthodontics and how to scale the practice. And so it was a, it was a great starting point for my career in orthodontics and with Invisalign to, to have a partner like Steven. But I think you're right. I think that a lot of doctors out there um, need to take advantage of, of the resources that their aligned TMs have. Um, you know, even if they're newer, I think coming on and working with you, um, I didn't know, I didn't even know what the teeth were numbered back then, right? And I, I and, and Stephen's so good. I remember we had our first, uh, you know, dinner with your team celebrating that you just hit platinum, which I had nothing to do with. I just brought the plaque out to Grand Prairie and you and I sat together after the team had left and you said, you know, so what do you, what would you say at this point? You know, what do you think I should do? And in my mind, I'm thinking... I don't know what I'm doing, like, but we had great conversations and we're able to bounce things off. But I think even if your line reps are newer, um, they have a ton of resources, right? And everybody that they're connected with when they go to their meetings, they work with thousands of practices across North America. And, you know, I think as a doctor, if you ask them and you have a need and you're looking for something, they have a resource to go find it. Uh, and just being open to partnering with them uh, as long as they're open to, to partnering with you, right? There are some some reps that may not be, and there's some very, very good ones that, you know, dive into the business and understand the needs of, of their customers, which is, you know, hopefully what most do. With the number of practices that each rep would have under them, and of course things change, is it a safe statement to say that doctors get out of the relationship to what they put into? Because we kind of look at it sometimes, or at least I hear doctors talking about it, like, that the rep should be like on call for them to handle the most like simple of things that really don't take advantage of the knowledge of a, of a, of the partnership that could be there where it's like, Oh, I need a, a case reopened or I need them to go and call the technicians to expediate it. But to me, I feel like what sometimes happens is if you treat your rep really poorly or you do blow them off at PDC every year and don't send those emails out uh, like recognizing the fact that these reps are like a limited resource but they're or they're available to you but they're also available to everybody else and if you don't foster and grow that relationship you're going to miss out like your reps are people too yeah and if I they think, don't like yeah, the people I think it has to be mutual I've had the same experience like that you and Chris had I've had great reps and my doctor because obviously I'm not the doctor my doctors didn't really have a lot of time they're orthodontists they're busy for their reps um but so the reps kind of contacted me and so you know we went out for dinners and lunches and I fed them information of where we were struggling things that the doctor maybe should have said but didn't have time to and so that they like like i mean good for those reps they developed the relationship with me and grew me into like a unicorn like <laughs> you um but it's it's it, it you have to be respectful to them you have to give them the time and just like a friendship if you're not putting it in you're just easy you're just one of i don't know how many it used to be let's say one of 10 11 15 but now you're one of many and so if you're a pain in the butt client and you're giving nothing and you're really not growing so that you, like it's, you know, you're not even a, a contributing to their paycheck, really. Like mm. you're just a thorn in their would, side. Would you say, Kelly, you're not that get all their attention? Would you say that you are where you are? Because I would 100% oh, say that 100%. I, yeah, the same thing. So the statement is, um, I would say 100% that I'm here where I am right now because of because of that I guy mean, sitting think, on the other side I mean, of the screen. Not to, I know you very well, so I know you mm. were sitting back and watching all the lectures. So you're self motivated and passionate, so we both have that in common. But if it wasn't for my TMs and my RSMs um, allowing me and giving me permission to sit on on the doctor lectures, which I was not supposed to be at, and but my doctors weren't going, and they're like, "Hey, she wants to do it. Let let's see where this goes." And then they just kept letting me go. So without them. I would have only gotten as far as the Invisalign doctor site. Um, a line would have never found me. I wouldn't have been at any of these conventions as a doctor where, where I got picked up and then that fed into my passions. So yeah, I had great reps who I'm going to say my orthodontist didn't even like a couple of my reps, but I liked them. So they get along with me and that was the the pivoting. That was the catalyst. Um, and they made a lot of money. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, and that's what, for sure. <laughs> that's what I, so Chris, maybe could you give any insights, um, then both, can you give insights on two sides? Cause you see it now on both sides. Yeah. And this, we're going to have to have, we're going to say at the beginning of this, we're talking about, is this going to be like a, a one hour lecture or like lecture? Is this a one hour podcast? 
is this going to be a three part series or is this going to be a 12 part series? But we're looking more in the 12 part. Like the Harry Potter, it goes on and on and on. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. (laughs) But can you give insights right now? I don't even know if we've really touched on the majority of of what we had on the outline, but uh, yeah, I, I would say, well, one, what I'll say is move when I moved to a line. So I, I went through a number of management roles and, and rep roles when I was in the uh, pharmaceutical industry um, and, and met great people and worked with great people. But moving over to a line, what I would say when I started a line is uh, the people that I worked with there were exceptional, exceptional at what they did. I'd never seen a, an industry or a company where people, the focus was partnership. Right. And and it wasn't like that in pharmaceutical sales. You know, we were the typical salespeople going in and giving you your three marketing messages. You know, our product does this, this and this, and it's better than the other product because of this, this and this. Will you use this for your next 10 patients kind of thing, um, which is not at all, you know, how I worked when I worked at a line or even when I moved to, to you know, Smile Sonica and Able as VP of sales there. But uh, really, it's the goal is is to develop partnerships and and I, and I haven't been with a line for a number of years now, and I know things change as companies grow, but I do believe that the majority of the TMs uh, out there are still looking to partner. So to your point about they, they have a lot of doctors that are within their individual territories, and um, certainly as you are a more experienced salesperson, you're going to spend the time with the people who want to engage with you. Right. Um, and if you're not one of those people, then, you know, they probably have 400 other clinics and doctors that they can go work with. Right. And you only have as much bandwidth. And I guess perhaps maybe when I was working with a line, because I had already had almost 20 years of sales experience, I wasn't, you know, I was in my 40s. I wasn't really a brand new green rep, uh, I would actually tell doctors, you know, and it's typical, a lot of clinics, they'll say, sure, come on in, do a lunch and learn. I'd say, I'd love to do a lunch and learn, but first you and I need to have a meeting. We need to set expectations. We need to set goals. And then when I come in and do the lunch and learn, you need to lead it. You need to be the leader. You need to tell your team why you're doing this and what your goals are and why I'm here to facilitate and help. I'm not just the one. And, and, and I said, you know, if I don't have that meeting and, you know, we don't do these steps first, then, you know, I have 400, 400 other accounts that I'll, I'll have to focus my time because my time is valuable. <laughs> and I don't think a lot of reps might do that. Um, and, and I learned from experience coming up into dental because pharma was similar in terms of clinics wanting lunch and learns, but it was only with the doctors in pharma. Very few times did you have the teams in and coming into dental, I think my first lunch and learn uh, was uh, was actually supposed to be with your 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 team, Stephen. Which mm. you know that that lunch and learns about well, how many people would you have had at that? And I didn't do it. Jason did it, but it'd be like <laughs> 25, 30 people, right? Which is kind of an eye opener. Yeah. So I would say, go, you know, going back to to your to your TMs, you know, if you have a TM that that is engaged with you and wants to partner as a doctor, and you're looking to take advantage of some of the resources, uh, then I would full wholeheartedly take the time to to do that. Or, you know, if you have someone like Kelly, that's super engaged, um, and, you know, just a top level team member, that's willing to kind of take a lot of that on and kind of bring that to you, if you don't have the time, then invest the time to let that person work with your uh, line team as well on the Invisalign side or, or whatever clear line or you're using, but sure. you know, for Kelly, us, it's, it's, I loved the, um, yeah. I loved the business aspect. Like, I, I mean, you guys are just so business savvy, you know, the numbers, things that I had no idea about. And until you tell me what the benchmarks are, um, how it can benefit my doctor, how can I save my doctor money? How can I make him money? These things mattered to me, but I didn't know how to get there. And I certainly wasn't watching the numbers other than my case, my case numbers. That uh, That's all I was watching. Those are the only numbers I had access to. And as soon as they showed me like the difference and like, I totally knew the money I was making for my boss or whatever. And that that's motivating. That's inspiring. You just need to give me somewhere to reach to, and then you're going for the next step and the next step. And so it it just, um, it was very, very motivating. And just to see how that works and how their minds work and, and to keep you organized and focused, um, and, and on all the innovations to it. So you didn't miss a beat. You didn't find out six months later that you could have been doing something or using a different product, whereas clinically, we kept up. I mean, we could we could keep up with that mm-hmm. part, but we're missing a whole nother 
spoke uh, spoke on the wheel. And Kelly, for you, did you find that were you more facilitating that initial conversation with the rep showing your interest in engagement or was it the rep going to your doctor and asking them if they had a key staff member? Or like, how did that initial do, I mean, it's going back a number of years, but for anybody who's listening right now, I guess we're probably hitting more doctors and more reps. Yeah. So do you have any advice to a rep for how they can find yes. a superstar Kelly in the rough and how as a doctor, how do they find that Kelly in the rough, <laughs> Kelly in the rough? I like yeah. That. So, so for <laughs> me, it was, um, the, the, the reps, the, the TMs and RSMs were definitely approaching my orthodontist. They okay. wanted to take my orthodontist <clears throat> out to lunch, to golf, to whatever, whatever, to have the conversations and the orthodontists um, are already wealthy and happy and healthy and whatever. And they're just being friendly. They're just Canadian. And they're like, sure, we'll go for right. lunch. But he'd be like, Kelly, come <laughs> with me. Like you're doing most of these, you know, it was like, meetings. you were pretty much put in there. So you could talk to the rep while the dentist would text in the corner. <laughs> yeah. And eat their lunch. He was just like, you talk to him and right. whatever. And I was happy to do it because I was delivering the most of the Invisalign at that time. And so it was important to me. And I like to chat. So doctor's eating, I'm chatting, everyone's happy. Um, and then I would just start feeding and I would, so then the, the rep really realized like I should be emailing Kelly. I should be calling yeah. Kelly because I'm not getting any feedback or responses from the orthodontist. So it's not so much that he put me in charge. He put me in charge of the patients to keep the patients happy in the practice, but he had no real growth aspirations. Um, and then it just kind of happened. Uh, the rep got me motivated, but I would say from now um, being um, surrounded by so many ortho and GPs, if you go to some of your key team members or have at your lunch and learn, say, hey, I'd like anyone who's interested in pivoting or stepping up who, you know, is in, you know, wants something different to do to kind of step forward. Um, and let's have some conversations about that and then have the reps or um, it's probably the TMs, not so much the RSMs, um, you know, let them know what, what kind of roles in practice are available and then what resources are available to you so much more than when we started so much more. Yeah. I mean, we're one of the resources, obviously. Totally. So I, I'll give a couple insights here and then we'll move on. I would say I, so Takeaways for doctors who are watching this, and, and I know reps listen to this too. I, I mean, this is getting further and wider. I, I think that that relationship is so important. You have to foster it. You have to realize it goes on both sides. As a doctor, I would constantly be asking my reps, um, and hopefully I still do. So, Melon, if you're watching this right now and I'm dropping the ball in anyway, give me a smack upside the, upside the head. But but what, what do they need? What can we help with? Um, I, I, again, like, uh, I, I don't think this is inappropriate anyway, but I always just ask my rep kind of more vaguely. I'm not asking for everything, but like, I know that their numbers are based on quarter. So I'll be like, how's your quarter going? Right. Are you, are you needing a real push right now as we come into the end of the quarter? And if I can go ahead and help my rep out to make sure that they're hitting their numbers with cases that I already have kind of sitting there, if it's the difference of me making sure I click accept before that quarter ends, so that would be like at the end of uh, September, then I, I would just want to know like, hey, do you need some extra support? And, and we'll try to check in with that. Um, so how's your quarter going? How are things going for you in general? Like, it's almost like when you have a kid in the chair, sometimes I'll say like, uh, hey, Tommy, how are you doing? Like, how's school going? And they'll be like, oh, it, it, it's fine. It's good. How are you doing, Dr. Schalk? And you're almost like, what? Like this 10-year-old <laughs> just asked me how I am? Like I asked 25, 30, 40 people today how they're doing. You're the first one to ask me. And I think that's the same thing. I think that's the reason why when Chris got an email, how are you doing, Chris? It's nice to meet you. How can I support you? And even things like we would originally sit down and go through like the, the basics of like, these are tooth numbers. This is malocclusions. These are like how we take photos in our office. This is, these are all the things that I can contribute to this relationship and partnership. So I, I think I would say for sure, if, if you have the energy and the desire and the time to connect with your rep on that level, do it. The, the whole aspect of having a team member who's more involved, I think that's very, very valuable. <clears throat> and, uh, and, and something that I probably don't take advantage of enough right now of saying, okay, let's get my rep connected to my superstar employees and, and have them sitting down for a conversation. And maybe reps aren't doing the same thing where they're not like they're going out for lunch with the doctor or they're engaging with the entire team, but you're not saying, Hey, let's go ahead and have lunch with just the doctor and their top employee. Who's going to be the facilitator because as doctors, we have lofty goals and ambitions, but we often don't implement 
So we need the person who's going to be implementing there with us. We need the Kelly in the rough who is going to turn into a diamond. And, and you all know, like when you have those lunch and learns, I mean, uh, the, the key staff, often it's the mature staff who've been there for, for the ride for a long time with the doctor, um, they will shut it down. It doesn't matter if it's a product or if yeah. it's all aligners <laughs> or if it's like we're going to have a new bracket in stock or whatever. It, it will be shut down. We just look at each other and we're just like <laughs> not flying. Like we will eat your Swiss chalet and get out. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. Um, that's how that's how it works. So you need to get some key team members involved. There's usually one or two key people. And I, I wasn't even the key person at this office. I was just in charge of the Invisalign. I just quietly did my own thing in the back corner quietly as well. They, they separated me from the other. <laughs> I was going to say quietly. No. <laughs> quietly? It, wasn't, it wasn't quiet. I think I think I had a door on my room. <laughs> it was the only private it's office for an ortho hygienist ever. Yeah. <laughs> No, but, this this um, is this yeah, is you know keep keep the keep the team engaged and um you know there's some like really exciting roles out there right now in GP ortho you know orthodont like ortho specialty or whatever there's some really amazing jobs so let let the team members know like hey you know this could refresh your whole career who's interested in this and and talk to them totally Chris can you give an insight here when approaching a staff because you've probably seen it from every direction right you walk into an office and you've had it where like the dentist is super engaged and none of the staff are engaged you've had it where dentist is not engaged and the staff are super engaged and then you have a mix yeah do you find that you have more success with the initial conversations and creating growth if the doctor kind of targets and has one or two key staff members that are brought into the know to then disperse that to the staff let me just preface this and then I'll let you go with the, the I've had it before with our staff where we've gone ahead and we've tried to present something to all of them at the same time. And I found that it wasn't very effective because like Kelly said, there was a look given between one key staff member to another key staff member. And then it was like, nope, this is completely, it's never happening now. But do you think that bringing those staff members who are kind of the key movers and shakers, the captains of the, the team, so to speak in, in their areas, that that leads to more success or do you think going to the entire staff is more effective? Yeah, well, that's, that's a very broad question and it you know leads back to culture or in leadership. Uh, but I would say one, if the doctor is not engaged and not interested, obviously, then it's not going anywhere. Um, two, if the, the team is not engaged, but the doctors are very engaged, it's less likely to go anywhere. Um, and the doctors need to really lead their team, right? You know, you're the owner of the practice, you're the boss. And if you're not willing to lead the team, and I, and I understand from, you know, I've owned businesses and, you know, staffing and, and, and such is, is challenging. And if things are going along and, you know, you're doing fine, but you want to add something, but you don't want to rock the boat, uh, yeah. that can be challenging. Uh, but in order, if you want to grow your Invisalign side of your practice, certainly, one, the doctor needs to be engaged and also lead the team. Two, exactly to your point, if you have one or two key people that are also influential amongst your team, getting those people on board and understanding, and that might be to Kelly's point, is you know maybe you have those meetings separately with the doctor and your key people. You know, talk about the goals and what the focus is going to be and how we're going to implement that. Um, I think that's that's the key strategy is is developing an implementation plan within your practice and not just saying okay we want to do more Invisalign let's do it you know I don't I can't count I can count hundreds and hundreds of times where a doctor says yes I want to do more Invisalign in my practice I want to grow the orthodontic let's do it and nothing ever happens because the steps that are needed to 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 be taken don't happen right and that's the leadership and that's engagement of your team so yeah I would say. For sure, the growth will come when the, you get one or two team members to kind of disseminate that. But you have to have that plan in place. It can't be just, yeah, we're going to do more, right? You have to understand what's, what are we, what, start with the end in mind. You know, what's our goal, right? Let's work backwards. And how do we achieve those? And, you know, is it having this many conversations in hygiene that will translate into this many number of patients accepting and, and so on and so forth? So, so yeah. And I think it can be like it's so well presented, just like, hey, guys, I'm really passionate about this. I'm going to do this. 
in my practice, I mean, you work for me, that's implied, obviously. So like, this is what we're doing. And I have two, you know, um, don't maybe don't call them team leads, because honestly, even if you are the lead, it puts pressure on us. And then we get bullied by the team members. <laughs> not gonna lie, that happens. <laughs> so call us something, but maybe not a leader, don't put it right out there, but something nice, like whatever, um, just so that, hey, I'm going to put these guys in the position, they're going to take more responsibility on no one wants that. They're going to take responsibility, these two guys, um, but I need you to help them. They're going to let you know. So yeah, you're all going to be scanning. You're all going to be charting. You're all going to be doing X, Y, Z because we're all group, but this is where I'm going. And then it's up to them. You can come along. If you don't come along, they naturally let, let get left behind. You don't have to fire anyone. They, they're either along for the new passion or they want to go to like, you know, the old, the old guy down the street. Yeah. Who's find still, someone. You know, <laughs> yeah. It's more in of the olden days. <laughs> And I'll just add one one last thing, just based on on what uh, you'd said, Stephen. Is um, one as a as a sales professional, there's nothing that warms your heart more than a doctor reaching out and saying, "Is is there something I can do to help you?" Yeah. Right. I've you know, if I have a salesperson has have, have done a lot of things to help grow your business, which is beneficial to the salesperson, obviously, in terms of hitting their numbers. But to have a doctor say, "Is there something I can do to help you?" Um, you don't hear that very often, obviously. Uh, and it's it's awesome. But I, I would say that the number one thing you need to do with your TMs is just tell them what your goals are, right? Um, if they are new or they don't have the resources at the tip of their fingers to help you, uh, they'll go find it, right? If you tell them, I want to be able to do this, I want to do, to do this. Um, and I think maybe just even sharing kind of our journey, Stephen, a little bit in terms of your goal was to, you know, be doing Blow it up. <laughs> yeah, well, blow it up. Yeah, <laughs> pretty much. Be the youngest Invisalign provider in the world, uh, diamond provider. So the and which was a goal actually. <laughs> yeah, it was. Us, right, and also yeah. to hit diamond was was a goal, and but also to just be clinically proficient and the thought about going back to residency. So we talked about all of these things, and my question was, well, what can I do to help you? And and I think at one point Stephen said, if you can get me in to some of these top orthodontists or connect me in some way, shape or form, that would be awesome. And I think we ended up connecting yeah. with Dr. Yeah. Alviali, who ended up coming back in, and working in your practice, kind of giving you that mini residency, yeah. going to Minnesota, which I actually got to go and which was super beneficial for me to go spend time in Regina Blevins' office for a few days and, and kind of see how she worked uh, her office, which she's amazing. Um, and it, you obviously went out and found other mentors yourself on your own without me, but I was willing to do whatever I could to help you achieve those goals because I knew in the long run, it was going to pay dividends to to myself on my sales performance as well. Totally. Yeah, no, I, oh. I, I think that that's very true. Just right. That symbiotic relationship. And I think one of the things that's also important, which it, it kind of goes without saying almost, but when you actually then uh, I guess, see it after the fact, it's, it's easier to kind of like look back and, and realize that's the thing is having someone to talk to about your goals and your ambitions, potentially completely unfiltered. Cause there's things that I might say to you that I wouldn't say to, to my staff about like, this is my ambition and my goal financially. This is my ambition and my goal, um, with like the case volume and, and, and whatnot. Like the staff, I think knew that we wanted to hit Diamond Plus, but I might not feel as comfortable talking about all of the profitability metrics and numbers with them in the same way that, that I could say to you. And it's kind of that whole thing of like, well, in order to have a, a target and a goal, you need to start, like you need to start talking about it and thinking about it and writing it down. Yeah. Maybe I didn't write it down specifically and like hang it above my door frame. So every day that I go out and see it, but it's like, because we're having those conversations all the time, it changes where it's not this far out concept of like, oh yeah, we can, we can go ahead and, and first with Jason hit 60 cases in 30, uh, in 90 days that, that was talked about. And it was like, yeah, we're going to do this. This is what's going to happen. And then with you, Hey, we're going to then go ahead and hit diamond two quarters later two two half years later. Like we, um, I think that that's just so powerful. Yeah. It, yeah. It keeps you accountable because you're yeah. having these conversations. So Chris knows you want it. You're committing to it. He's committing to you. So he's failing you if you don't, if you don't hit that milestone and vice versa, you're failing yourself really. Totally. <laughs> if you don't hit it. There's an um, accountability yeah. partner. Yeah. You don't need the whole team in on it. Um, you know, because I well, am one of the team members. I will say, 
I, I worked for some of the greatest practices that I worked for. Um, they actually gave us the numbers. We knew exactly how much money we were bringing in and how much they were making, which you might think like, oh, because I'm not getting any of it. Does that make me feel bad? No, I get it. You went to a lot of school. You're wealthy. You know, as long as I'm making a decent amount, like, you know, on par or slightly above par, um, it is a motivating. The numbers are motivating. Um, otherwise, we're just going through our day, very vanilla, mm -hmm. very chicken soup, blah. Totally. I, I can see that. And I think it's kind of figuring out what type of staff you have. Yeah. When we were first starting, the challenge we ran into is that being in a more transient city, there was so much turnover. And so you yeah. didn't necessarily have the the years of trust built up. Like, I, I, don't get me wrong. I trust my staff and I really like my staff in those timeframes too, when we first started. But it, it was just that situation where I couldn't necessarily share with them because they might've only been there for three months in yeah. that role. And then they're telling you like someone down the street or whatever. Yeah. And yeah. And to invest in people, it's exhausting to invest in key team members and then they leave. It, it's hurtful. It is. Yeah. <laughs> it's hurtful. There's a whole podcast in and of itself right there. <laughs> Who, are, we, so well. are we going through therapy right now? Chris, can you be our therapist? Clinical stuff. <laughs> so, okay. I want to keep things rolling Yeah, let's here. circle back. So we obviously have the passion, the clinical and the business <laughs> savvy. So we've got quite a nice <laughs> yeah. little package going here. So now we can, we, we really want to bring that to like our members and our followers. And um, I get asked all the time by email, people are calling and WhatsApping me saying, Hey, like Kelly, what advice do you have? Or who can I connect? I want like real life conversations. I want to know why are why am I not closing? What am I not being successful at? So maybe Chris, since you're the business, well, we're all business, but let's say you're the business expert of this podcast. Um, maybe you can give us some advice on like, what are the, some of the key reasons that people are being unsuccessful? Hmm. Yeah. Well, first I, I don't think I'll say I'm the business expert. I think Steven has run a juggernaut of a practice yeah. and has tremendous amount of business expertise. I, I just have had the opportunity to be in hundreds and hundreds of dental practices and see what is going on and, and how you know successful dentists and team members are are being successful and how others maybe aren't being as successful. But I think what we, we really need to do is, is kind of bring it back to um, why do patients not say yes? Or if you want to think of it in a grander scheme of why do consumers not buy, right? And there's there's really five reasons why people don't buy. And we can all think of ourselves when we're going out to buy something and what is stopping us. But it's really that there's there's no need is the first one. There's no trust is the second. There's no value, right, is the third. Uh, there's no time is the fourth. And also there's no money, right? So if you are able to look at those five things in terms of time, trust, value, need, and money, then you can probably address, you know, why those people are, are not moving forward with treatment. So, you know, I think it's interesting. We, we often talk about consumers and consumerisms. And, and, and when we we're, you know, when I was at a line, we talked about you know, the consumer behavior and gave a lot of statistics and, and tried to, you know, help offices understand the new consumer, right? And what is the new consumer and who are you actually dealing with on a regular basis, whether it's, you know, the millennials or, or Gen Z now um, or Gen X, and, and they all function very differently. But I think as a whole, we can all look at, you know, why do we buy things and why do we not, right? And that's the same for your patients. So, you know, we could probably just talk about those five different things, right? Like if we looked at, you know, why people aren't buying, number one is there's no need. So I guess, you know, Stephen, how, how would you say in your practice, you guys have the patient understand that there's a need because really you're selling a solution. There's nothing mm -hmm. worse than saying to your patient as a hygienist or an assistant or a doctor, oh, have you ever thought about Invisalign? Because yeah, Invisalign yeah. is just a tool. Yeah right? It's a tool to move your teeth into proper position and provide better oral health and, and you know, so on. Um, so I, if you, if anyone's saying that, you know, I ah. highly recommend stop saying that. So but, cringy. Yeah. yeah. You like, know, and who wants to say that? When they start, you know, bringing, especially dental practices that just start with Invisalign, um, because it's, it's well-branded. Everybody knows what Invisalign is for the most part. Uh, and it's a, it's a trap that people fall into, but I don't know, maybe 
Stephen, talk to how you sure. treat the need <clears throat> for your patients. Yeah, I mean, it, it's really just taking it back to talking about problems and solutions. And once you kind of get it and you think about it, like it makes sense about how you're presenting it. If you start off with saying, have you ever thought about Invisalign or something like that? You're really only going to get the people who are pretty much ready to like give you their money right now because they have been thinking about it and they're not thinking they need Invisalign. They're thinking, I wish that I had straighter teeth potentially for aesthetics or for function or for whatever reason. They've been thinking about that. They, they want to have straight teeth, but that's what they want. Nobody is like sitting around being like, I really want, unless they're 12, some of those patients do genuinely. Like I want the plastic trays because it's going to make me cool at school when I can pop them in and out, whatever. But for any adult patient, they're, they're, they're not wanting Invisalign. They want the results, right? They wanted the straight teeth. And so really what we're, we should be talking to them about is essentially the problems and the issues. So before, like I'm not coming in and saying, Hey, have you thought about this or do you want to do this? I often actually don't even really necessarily, this probably isn't great, but I don't necessarily even ask them if they've, they've thought about it before I should probably, Neither. but yeah, what I've I come never, in and I I've show, yeah, I come in and I show them like, what are we as the doctor? We're the, we're the clinician, we're the diagnostics that's given the diagnostician, whatever we want to say. So we're the ones that come in and we diagnose and we show them the problems and they're the ones that give them the solution. And so the problems are the chipping, the grinding, the wear, the crowded teeth leading to challenging hygiene, the lingually positioned crowns of the posterior teeth that are hitting heavy and wearing and, and, and causing abfraction at the gum line, the crossbites, the um, large overjet in a kid situation where we want to try and use class two mechanics to correct that overjet so they're not going to smash their front teeth playing sports and then damage their front teeth. Whatever that problem is, that's what we want to start talking about. And again, in adults, it's very easy. It's like lower incisors, they, if they have a deep bite, it's getting smashed to pieces. If they have an open bite, you know there's a tongue habit or a thumb sucking habit or a lip trapping habit. Some type of habit is causing an open bite because open bites are not normal. So deep bites and open bites, really, really easy. You go ahead and you show them the smash down teeth or you show them the open bite and you explain to them that those are supposed to be an occlusion. They should be touching so that their bite is even everywhere. Yeah. You usually any, see th any teeth that aren't in their parking spot. They don't have a parking spot, whether it's a growing smile, an adult smile. And I think like we just have the luxury of saying to the patient, I mean, like the discovery is, you know, that patient. So I know this patient, maybe she's 70 years old in my chair. And I know that the most important thing to her is function. It's not aesthetics. I might have a different yes. 70 year old where it's all aesthetics because she's losing her magic. She feels like, and whatever, like, so you have to figure out what, what, what is her motivator? And it's really not to sell the product or to make money. That's just a bonus. That's just icing on the cake for me. I'm not selling anything. I hate selling. Me too. Period. Um, but for me, it's like, if this was my mom, if this was my aunt, my best friend, my, my child, um, what would I want to do? And, and we're lucky in the sense that we worked long enough or we've been educated long enough and seen enough photos and education that we know what that smile is going to look like in five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. And so we're just helping them out. Like, Hey, if you were my sister, have you ever like thought about doing this? Cause like, this is what's going to happen. I can show you pictures or whatever, or you just talk about it. And they're just like, wow. And you're just, you're just coming across as like a regular human being. It's yeah. just conversational. There is no scripting. Well, scripting <laughs> is so cringy too. <laughs> People are like reading off little paragraphs, like all across the nation. It's insanity. Just <laughs> we're human beings. We're just telling you like it is. Yeah. Your teeth are chipping, wearing, fracturing, like, Hey, your teeth are blocked out. Your kid's going to have two to three years of ortho, or we could intervene, intervene now and they could be done by grade eight grad. Yeah. I, that's well, the and I think what you're really hitting, which is the value here is we've shown them the problem and then we're showing them the solution of like, ideally we'd like for your teeth to be in these positions. And to your point, I, I kind of know, like everybody knows that fixing your teeth with aligners is going to result or braces or whatever is going to result in nice straight teeth at the end of the day. Um, and it's going to look good. Like nobody thinks like, oh, you're going to fix my bite, but you're not going to fix my gnarly front teeth that look ugly. Like, no, everybody knows the aesthetic component of it. It kind of goes without saying. So we usually don't need to present that to them. They know that part. What they don't know, because we do a poor job of explaining, is the the rest of it. The occlusion, the bite, the fraction, the chipping, the wear, the recession, the 
all of those different aspects. And for some doctors out there, they unfortunately, I don't know if they just from dental school were never educated as to those issues um, and still don't genuinely know the value of putting the teeth in the right spot. I think once you take a course or you see some case results and you kind of see it, then you get it. And you're like, oh yeah, like how harmful is this malocclusion? Like it's, it's extraordinarily harmful in the long term. But when we first come out, we don't really have that education. So sometimes that slips by. But what, what you do, once you get that as a doctor, as a staff and as a team, that you understand the need, like you're saying, Chris, patients don't think there's a need for it. Well, your staff also has to understand the need for it. The associate dentists have to understand the need for it. Everyone needs to understand why this is so important, why it's worth spending seven to $8,000 to fix these teeth. And then we can talk about, well, here's the options, right? One option, we use brackets and wires. It's been done for the last hundred years or so. It's not gonna be very comfortable, not gonna be very aesthetic, it's gonna be hard to eat foods. There's certain things you can't eat. It's gonna take longer. Like you said there, Kelly, you have to wait till you're older, till all the permanent teeth really are in to really truly start. Or we go ahead, we do with clear liner therapy. So I, I think that would be, to answer your question here, Chris, that would be kind of, again, yeah, how I kind of approach it with the patients. And then also ideally with the staff and, and with the, the, the other associate doctors. And really one of the, the biggest things that you can possibly do is taking an intraoral scan. If you don't have a scanner, it doesn't mean you can't start having these conversations. But what I would do is I wouldn't just tell them they have wear. I would show them they have wear. I would show them the recession. I'd show them those things with a mouth mirror. Just they hold the mirror up, you show them what's going on. If you have an intraoral scanner, use the intraoral scanner. Show them on a health scan essentially what it what it looks like everywhere. Yeah, or so. like if you don't have a scanner, which I mean, you're just throwing money away basically if you don't have a scanner because the amount of like restore, like the amount of dentistry you're missing by not showing the patient that this image is crazy, um, ortho aside, but anyways, um, but even uh, our, our mouth mirrors and retractors that we use for intraoral photos um, for ortho, if, if you took that image, that's one image of the whole arch lined up. You can see so much in that, True that as well. those two, intra like the two occlusal views. Um, but uh, yeah, the scan is the scan is crazy. Um, one one point I'll jump in on. I agree with what you say, Kelly, in terms of like having the full script, like word for word, written mm -hmm. out. But one thing that I think could have value, and, and we've done it before, is to have like a, a a script, not in the sense that it's giving you every word, but having just key words written on it, a like having things starter. like this yeah. concerns me because or I not, say that all the time. not not even yeah. but yes, but but even something just where we have it like. Um, you, you have like written in every operatory, like on a laminated sheep showing like chipping, damage, wear or yeah. wear ring, you're wearing your teeth. Like just those kind of like key points that you want to make sure you're discussing, which are there. You just might not be actually saying it. And then same thing about like, like having a subcategory like solutions and then saying moving teeth with brackets and wires, moving teeth with aligners. And so it's just having a couple key points on them there. Yeah, no, no, I'm all for like cheat sheets yeah. and all that. But totally. no, there's like actual paragraphs that are floating around here that is like, huh, huh, huh. You like have, to, you have to own it. The exact same thing. Oh yeah. God. Yeah. You have to, to own it. It has to be natural. It just be a genuine conversation from a person, not that it feels like it's coming from a robot. Yeah. So I'll chime in there on the okay. scripting side of things only because I've spent you know almost 25 years in sales organizations where you get scripts all the time <laughs> um and and you know even at Align or at Smile Sonica when I was there I created scripts for team members just not for them to read it word for word but more to give them an idea so that they could convert that into their own way of saying it right mm -hmm. as a salesperson myself every time you know, through the years that I would learn something new or be, you know, talking about a new product, it was always really nice to actually have a starting point. It's like, okay, this gives me ideas of what I could say, and I'm going to take that information and convert it into my own style or yeah, yeah. listening to your colleagues, right? Like that, that's one of the other things I would say is if you have a, you know, a Kelly in your office who's super experienced and talks fantastically to patients and connects really well, you know, sit and listen and learn, right? Salespeople are no different. We go to meetings, we sit there and, and nobody loves the role play scenarios where you're sitting there doing the fake things. I think they're amazing. I think <laughs> offices should do it. I think that if you're really an office that wants to improve your communication with your patients around orthodontic treatment, 
you need to do some role play. And that means very uncomfortable situations for your team members, uh, doctors, doctors hate it too, but it forces you to actually have to say the words, right? It, it's like practice. There's no professional sports athlete that doesn't practice what they do. You know, this is practicing and even, you know, sales professionals hate it because it's always in front of your peers and nobody wants to be embarrassed in front of their peers, right? But at the same time, it should really be a learning opportunity. So scripting and practicing that scripting, even your front staff, right? If we're looking at overall conversion and converting new leads coming into the practice, you know, how do they answer the calls? And that's a whole other. Yeah, I love, I love that. Yeah. Like having booklets, like, like if someone asks for pricing, of course we have all pre-baked answers that are, you know, yeah. in the right direction. Cause we have all these consultants out there who are feeding us mm. amazing information. I love all of that stuff. It's just, yeah, the, the, the kind of, um, it's almost like templated clinchecks, templated treatment plans, right. There's templated, some really yeah. templated stuff out there. That's just, but, but, but I think what Chris is saying, which I like, cause I'll be honest in saying like, I don't love it. I'm, I think I'm pretty good at it. Actually at one point I did, um, there was a, uh, like uh what are we calling this again like where you sit down and you go through it like the mock sessions role playing, role playing. Exactly. that's the word yeah. thanks guys yeah. so when you're doing role playing um like i think i'm fairly good at it but i agree like i don't really love it from the standpoint of like oh man but it is valuable like when you sit down and you hear the wrong like there's certain things like we just said where you write down like all the words you want to hit those buzzwords there's also words that you don't want to say Right? right. Because sometimes you hit those words that are like inappropriate or they sound, I'm going to shave down your teeth in order to get them yeah. straight. It's like, well, no, I'm going to smooth between your teeth yeah. yeah, in order to remove a small amount of enamel. Right. Like there's, there's the things that you don't want to say too, unless you actually practice and you hear it, then you don't right. know. Like how many times have I heard for like a new assistant or a new hygienist that their, their operatory door is open and you heard them say something to the patient where you're just like, Oh, <gasps> They just said it like that. Like that was no, 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 no. And you only heard it because the door was open and you're walking past. Then you need to go and say to them like, Hey, no, you, you shouldn't say it that way. Yeah. So I think it kind of forces you to do that. One thing that, that we've done. So when I was working, um, with one of the doctors at our practice, so I'm training in all things, uh, in, in Visalign and in aligner therapy right now. Um, so she's, she's doing an amazing job. But for all of her initial consults, like the first one I actually sat in and I actually took her notes and she presented. And then I was able to go ahead and kind of like jump in and give her support. If she said something, I could go ahead and, and, and just elaborate more. After that one, then what I would do, because she just wanted that initial support, then I would actually have her take her iPhone, just leave it in her scrub pocket right here recording. Yeah. And then when she'd finished that consult, she'd come back out and we would go ahead and we'd listen to it together, the 15 minute consult. And then I'd be able to like give those quick little course corrections. Oh, mm -hmm. again, don't say sh we're going to shave down your teeth or we're going to grind them down at the end of treatment for Polish, veneers. Slender right? eyes, smooth. Yeah, exactly. Through the door. <laughs> <laughs> so <Millionaire them. laughs> exactly, exactly. So I, I think there's value in that as well is if you're not right now, consider recording yourself, consider yeah. recording the conversations, your staff, like don't do it secretly. No. And we deleted them immediately afterwards. I'm, I'm not a lawyer. I'm not giving you HIPAA compliant uh, things here. <laughs> I'm just saying, <laughs> If you if you record that deleted immediately afterwards or whatever, um, we it, do the same thing for yeah. like new team members. Uh, even if it's just bonding attachments, you think what conversations they've already committed or whatever. But it's just that flow. How do you get through that appointment so quickly and with all those instructions, or so that they don't sit up and think, "Oh my God, I'm tasting the edge." Blah 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 blah. You just record it. Like this is how I do it. So you don't mm -hmm. need to have someone hovering over you because that's awkward for the patient more than anything. Um, but yeah, record, 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 um, and, and correct. And or you don't even need to correct because honestly you can, they can hear it and they just ask questions. Yeah. It's fantastic. It takes totally. no more time. Yeah. Yeah. So, I'd agree. I'll just jump in on this. Yeah, yeah, totally. Like uh, audio recording is fantastic. Um, video recording. And I think we've all actually learned from, COVID and Zoom meetings, uh, you know, when COVID kind of hit, we went all to Zoom and we we're having these meetings and I would record a lot of my sessions. And it's really interesting, you know, going back and looking at yourself and how you speak and what you say and 
what are your filler words and what you know what are the things you want to keep saying and what are the things you want to stop saying uh because we used to at one point years ago you would when you would go to training for sales you would sit there you do your role play and they'd actually you know pull up a camcorder back then and, and record you and then you'd sit as a group and look back and evaluate but if you do do role playing sessions with your team you know recording those is really valuable right so they can look back and see even body language and and i'll touch on two other things and i'll pass it back it, it, you know what you had said Stephen, around the problems and the solutions i think align really does this very well as as their sales team comes in and talks to your team and they use the pcs model right problem consequence solution right so if your team presents in that way this is the problem that i see right? and i'm concerned about your wearing your chipping your uh etc cetera, etc cetera. and and these are the consequences this is what's going to happen if we leave this as is it's more of the same it will continue to happen and the solution is not invisalign the solution is you know putting your teeth oh, into yeah. occlusion and we use Invisalign in our practice, right? So I like, I really like that PCS model. I, it's always resonated really well with team members so that they can remember, um, mm -hmm. you know, rather than just talking about, and, and, uh, and to your question about uh, asking patients, have you thought about this? I think it's really good to ask them, have they ever thought, or are you aware of this lower chipping? Are you, have you thought about, you know, why this is happening? Has this ever come up in your mind? And, you know, a lot of patients might, and you'd probably do this or Kelly, you do this, but, you know, you're opening up that door to engage them with their own oral health and why the solution makes sense. Because if they don't know there's a problem and there's, then there's this, no matter, no matter what solution you give them. Totally. Uh, <laughs> and right? even, like, if, even if you're like, you've been their dentist for a year, two years, five years, 10 years, whatever, um, you know, you can just say, hey, have you noticed this is getting worse? Because, I mean, I've noticed even if I just started noticing two months ago, because <laughs> my boss told me to, but like, so then you're not throwing yourself under the bus, but are, have you noticed that this is getting worse? We've been charting you and documenting and probing you and next X, Y, Z, whatever their problem is, doesn't mm -hmm. matter. And does this concern you? Like, it concerns me because I see this so many times a day and like, this is the path it takes you on, blah, 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 blah. And they'll either be like, no, it doesn't concern me. And that's fine because they're just thinking. They're going to go home and they're going to think, does it concern me? What's she talking about? Because that's what I would do. I would probably shut them down because that's just me I would in a nice way. But I would probably be like, no, it doesn't. Don't tell me what I need to buy or whatever. And then I would go home and think about it and then probably want more information and book a more in-depth consult so that they can explain it to me. Because on the fly, you feel kind of pressured. We're always pressured to buy things all the time on, in mm -hmm. that moment. So I wouldn't put pressure on them. Just educate, educate, and then, you know, let them know the next steps. And giving that them a voice. Other, you're, that you're, was you're, my other. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Go oh ahead. I was just, I was just going to say, you're, you're giving them that opportunity to speak. Right. Yes. You're, you're letting, you're listening to them. Does, is this something you've noticed um, that is, that is getting worse? Yeah. And, and then you kind of are able to gauge how much they seem to value correcting this or not correcting this. Yeah. yeah. And if they even knew about it to begin with, but at mm -hmm. least now we've opened the door to be like, Oh, have I never showed you this before? Here you go. Let me show you. Well, I never yeah. had this scanner before, so it was hard to show you. Or, I, we, or, or honestly, I would even go with the approach of like, we, as a profession continue to get better. And now that yes. we have this scanner, now I yeah. can see like, wow, look at all the, and Chris, you did something very smart, which is exactly how I present it as well. Have you noticed that your teeth are chipping, wearing, receding? It's a Actually, current, yeah. and yeah. it's, it's something that's currently ongoing. How many times do you have a patient who says, oh, I was really stressed when I was pregnant or at my last job and I was grinding my teeth really hard and now I've stopped. Yeah. And you're like, your teeth are teeny little pegs here. I don't think that you just all of a sudden magically stop. Like the musculature is what it is that you've developed. You have a strong bite. You don't just all of a sudden stop grinding your teeth like that. It's, it's a, you're grinding, you didn't grind. So continuing to use those words of, of, of a continuing process, um, is important. Sorry, I cut and you for off, anyone Chris. Who wants all of that, let's call it scripting for lack of a better term. Um, like a line has all of that. It is written out, is well baked. It's in PowerPoints. It they can give that to you. Talk um, we've to been your rep. Years with a line because I, I taught that same thing. But they can literally give you um, all of that data. I mean, there's 
full out hygiene and team uh, team learns um, with all of that verbiage and really great education. And also kind of like just, I mean, to get the team on board, because without the team on board, it's like selling whitening and the team doesn't want to do it. It just falls flat, but letting them know like, Hey, we're building better smiles. It's the foundation. Like what would you build without a good foundation? Like not even a Lego tower, right? So if your Lego is not stacked right at the beginning, your crowns, your perio, you could be cleaning this person's teeth like like a diva for the next 20 years. It's still going to fail because you haven't addressed the foundation. And so then the team can be like, oh yeah, I want to, most team members you would hope would be like, oh, I want to know better, do better. And so let's have this conversation. It's legally, you have to give them the option. If you know, if you know about it, you have to, presented it's you can't just skip the ortho component like you go through all of them like root canals crowns perio all of these different things but somehow on the the charting we just put class one and turn the page that's ridiculous (laughs) especially when the ortho is what's contributing to so many of these problems you look at the bite and you're like oh they have an open bite they're only biting on their posterior six teeth oh well why do all those need crowns because they keep fracturing oh they have the foundation and you're saving them years and years of dental money. Well, so as well don't as think things that you're costing them like seven thousand yeah. dollars. you you could be saving, saving them seventy thousand. Especially too the fact that you can't undo some of these things that are done. Oh, sure, yeah. you could try a graft and it might take, but but it doesn't necessarily mean that they're getting back what they had when they were eighteen. No. So if you can prevent those issues from occurring, then you've you've saved them so much not just time and money, but also irreversible damage or harm that happened from having their teeth in a poor position that you you can't truly ever fix it back to what it was. No, no. Yeah. Yeah. So Chris, what if we checked off out of your your key five? I think we've got, we're we're still on the need. (laughs) The need, the need. I think we've touched on a number of things, but the, uh, I I do want to just one, just go back to a couple, couple things like being salesy. Uh, Kelly mentioned that. I know Stephen. I think at some point nobody wants to be sold, right? No. Patients don't want to be sold. I don't. Like, I hate going to buy a car. I don't want you know the the salesman trying to sell me. But I think that we have to be realistic in the fact that dentists are business owners. Um, of course, you know, or health first. Um, but at the end of the day, you are ultimately selling dentistry. So somebody needs to sell. Right in the practice, and I think the definition of salesperson, uh, being a salesperson myself for many many years, um, often, and I don't know how many orthodontic offices I've been in talking to treatment coordinators, I say I'm not a salesperson, I'm an educator, and in my mind, I'm like, what do you think sales is? Sales is providing solutions to needs, right? If somebody needs something, and that's kind of what we're talking about, if you can define what the need is and what your patients are. And understand what the patient's needs are. If you provide a solution, you're still you're selling, but it's not the greasy car salesman. Yeah, like those kiosk that, people in the oh, mall who are passing yeah. out the cream. We don't want to be those those no. aligned right. therapy people. Right. right. Yeah. And and so I think we have to get past the idea of, you know, definitely you don't want to be like one of those kiosk people that's, you know, trying to grab you as you're walking by with your family, but the understanding that sales is more than that. It's about connecting with people. This is about developing trust and then also providing information to, 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 uh, for the need that is a solution for what your patients need. And that's, that's still sales, right? Yeah, it's just a matter of both. Yeah. And, and we really believe it. Like we really believe in what we're doing. We, right. we know we're offering like something we would offer to our own parent. Uh, we believe it and we're passionate about it and we're delivering high quality goods. So there's nothing cringy about that. And maybe yeah. I can just say something that I think is a testament. So sometimes I'll have a patient who says like, oh, I would never want to get like plastic surgery or Botox or anything. Because look at all those like celebrities who have terrible plastic surgery or Botox. And you go, well, really a plastic surgeon once told me that a good plastic surgeon should be doing work that nobody knows is plastic yeah. surgery. Amy once right. said to me, she's just like, you know, I don't really like salespeople at all. And I hate pharma reps. And because and, <laughs> my doc, my wife is a doctor. And and so she's just like, and I said, well, like, what about like Chris is in sales and his role in Invisalign? And, and she says to me, she's just like, oh, but Chris, he's not, he doesn't sell. He's not in sales. And it was like a really good person at sales. It's kind of like plastic surgery or bad cosmetic dentistry. If you can tell that the same thing that we get, right? Where it's like, oh, I don't want the, those perfect fake Mexican crowns. 
Okay, well, if you can see it, it means that it's being done poorly. Sales yeah. does not mean that you're grabbing somebody by the scarf <laughs> to pull them into the kiosk. Sales is when you educate somebody towards something that they will value, will benefit from and show the value of it, allowing them to make their decision, not forcing them to do something they don't want to do. It's pretty much like, like you said, being great in sales means that you're an educator and, and you're just helping provide them with showing them their problem and showing them the solution and giving a path to them in, in a non-aggressive way. And so I thought that was such a testament when Amy said that, that she's like, Chris doesn't do sales. <laughs> and, and that's the thing, because if someone likes you, um, they trust you. So whether it's your hygienist, your dentist, or, or any any relationship, really, they like you and trust you. And so they respect your opinion. So if you say or you present something just like, hey, this concerns me, they're listening. And all of a sudden, you've led them down that path. And so, yeah, you sold them. Um, but again, it, it's for their benefit. So it's all in a very It's healthy- not the sales that they're thinking of. It's not greasy car no. salesman sales. That sales done wrong. Yes. Yeah. Hundred yes. percent. And I, I'll, I'll finish with a like. I think we've covered the need portion for pretty good here. But I'll finish with a little story that both of you know. I, I, I just recently had a wonderful root canal yesterday. Finished, uh, finished the second portion of it, and it kind of brings me back. And thank you to Dr. Nathan Wong out of Edmonton, oh, who I, I don't know if he listens to the podcast. He's part of our Clearly Next Level group. He's an amazing okay. dentist, one of the best that I've ever seen. My family goes there. But I have been seeing a different dentist for many, many years. Um, Peter. You know, since I was 18. <laughs> um, Dr. Nathan wanted to do my root canal. But uh, going back to the need. So I, I've had you know, a amalgam filling for, I don't know, since I was 12 years old. And, you know, it's, it's deteriorated and, and cracked. And it's been like that for many, many years. Um, and I know that my dentist at the time was not wanting to be salesy. He didn't want to try to sell me on fixing this, this filling that was probably still okay and probably didn't need to be done right away. But I also didn't get the education on what the possible consequences were, right? In terms of if that filling failed and things started to get in there and there was possible infection, and then I might lead to a root canal which is not the best experience, right? And a long time to sit there with your mouth open and hearing all these drills and things like that. So <clears throat> for me, I was actually a little bit upset that I wasn't educated earlier on what the potential consequences of fixing that filling were because I've always had good dental coverage. I would have done it like that. But in my mind, my dentist was like, you know, I really would like to, to fix that at some point. Is it bothering you? I'm like, no, it's not bothering me. Okay, we'll keep an eye on it. But if you would have said, you know, I'd really like to fix that filling. Is it bothering? No, it's not bothering me. These are the possible consequences that may occur should it fail further. And it may lead to an infection, which may lead to a, a root canal, which we definitely don't want. And I would have said there, okay, let's fix that, right? So this is really translatable into all of the, you know, procedures and dentistry that you guys uh, the dentists provide is just providing the understanding and that there's a need for something uh, goes a long way to your patients accepting treatment, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the first question that anybody, you know, once you have presented a treatment to a patient and they go to your financial coordinator, your, your, your treatment coordinator, whatever it may be, first question to the patient is, do you understand why the doctor has prescribed this treatment or offered this treatment? Because if the patient doesn't understand they don't see the value. They don't see the need. They're not going to move forward with treatment. So never present any fees, any financials till you totally know that the patient understands the value or the need. So I, uh, yeah. uh, I think that is a <laughs> profound, profound story because we see it as doctors too, like being the one on the other side that, that you see that patient that was either your own patient or somebody else's patient where you're like, oh man man, like that tooth just fractured. Why didn't I do a better job of, of explaining the, 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 the negative consequences? And sometimes you do, and the patient still doesn't do it. And you're like, well, I, I warned you. And then they're, they're like, hey, I'll do that crown now after it's completely like broken to the point that it needs to be extracted. But how many times do we not take that time because we were too busy or because we thought the patient was going to judge us for selling 
Yeah. Or, or you put your own limiting beliefs. Like I did it for years as a young hygienist thinking, well, they probably don't have the money because I come from a big family and you know, we're not just throwing our money around. And so you think, well, they probably can't afford it. Or like that 70 year old um, probably doesn't want to fix this because she should go on a cruise. These are (laughs) are my own things I'm thinking in my head, but you know, she might've been saving up her whole life for this and not even realize that she's a candidate or whatever. And, and really it's not for us to decide our, our, as healthcare providers, we need to put all options on the table and step back and then educate them onto all the options and they choose. And so I learned that as I got more mature, like it, it, the pressure's not on me. My, my job is to present you all the options and you get to choose from the whole menu. Hmm. Then it's on you. Yeah, Let's absolutely. Let's that way. Absolutely. Well, what I think we're going to do here, we're at an hour and 15. I think there's so much more meat to go into in this conversation. What I, what I think we'll do here is we're going to do a part two because we still have to make it through of the five different uh, aspects Chris talked about. We still have four more to go through. So we're going to do a part two. I think that there's some relatable aspects, though, into what we're talking about right now of, of, of us at Clearly Aligned. I think sometimes I've been so hesitant to even, like in a podcast like this, I we, we don't talk. We give so much value, but we don't actually then provide necessarily the solution to doctors for here's all the different things. We recognize that doctors are undereducated and they don't have the knowledge and skill set in front of them to present this treatment. And so I I think I would be um, missing the whole point myself of, of having those conversations and being more comfortable. I'm so worried sometimes that if I talk for 30 seconds in a podcast about what we have going on, and about the different offerings that we give that you you guys, the viewers, are going to turn off and you're tune out and you're going to say, hey, like they're just trying to sell me on something. But I do think it's important that that I do a better job of recognizing that myself. And so here's what I want to talk to you about, like the things we have going on. So if you're a doctor right now and you're watching this and you're saying, OK, I, I like what you guys are putting out there and I like the philosophies that you propose of comprehensive treatment for patients without cut and corners then I want you to check out our, our, our site, clearlyaligned.ca. A lot of you probably are already there. Check out the course offerings. We've got a huge range of things going on from foundational systems um, for those who are just getting started. We've got attachments and biomechanics for how to actually plan your clin checks and take control yourself. We've got diagnosis development and treatment planning for the, 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 the cases that are just to understand what you're looking at when you look at a mouth and a face and a ceph and everything else. Um, we have a program that's, that's coming in place here. Uh, I would say probably the best approach for getting in touch with us is to reach out to Chris directly. Um, but the, the program is called Clearly Next Level. And that's our philosophy. We're going to take you to the next level. There's some restrictions that apply. This isn't um, necessarily something that everybody can be a part of. Uh, Again, the details, Chris can kind of go through them if you're a doctor who's interested in this. But if you want to take your aligner practice to the next level um, with a a group of dentists who have very similar philosophies here of comprehensive treatment uh, and, and kind of unlock a lot of like educational resources as well as group resources for your staff, um, then reach out to Chris and he'll be giving details of, of how this program in particular works. And Chris, your email? Yeah, it's Chris, C-H-R-I-S, at clearlyaligned.ca. So fairly simple. And I, I just add to that that, you know, it's, it's essentially an Invisalign-specific growth network, uh, which is centered on comprehensive education, but also has a lot of other components that will allow you to be more profitable in your practice practice as you grow your Invisalign. So um, we have uh, you know, close to 100 doctors involved across North America right now, and uh, and we'll be growing the uh, the network quite quickly here in the next uh, few months. So certainly if like that sounds like fun. you. Yeah, it's a super fun uh, supportive tribe. We're all like constantly you know, on different platforms together. And I mean, I think the statistics, um, because again, I told you I was motivated by numbers, <laughs> the statistics of like growth and um, o- Q over Q is amazing. Even for people who just started, like it, it's really uh, rewarding for them to see. So I think everyone's feeling really fantastic about it. Who's joined yeah. We're all pumped. Yeah. yeah, it's been yeah. pretty remarkable. Yeah, so if you, if you do want to learn more about that, reach out to me. Uh, we can have a conversation more about what the network is. Uh, you may already know some colleagues that are part of it. Uh, you can ask them about the educational benefits as well as, you know, the benefits to the practice. But uh, 
number one is just really come talk to me and we can yeah. we can fill yeah. you more in. I feel like this is like the secret for those who made it through the entire podcast since this is this is, yeah. a, this is an yeah. opportunity that's not available <laughs> right now online. There's nothing on Facebook. There's nothing on our website. There's nothing in any capacity. The only way you get into this exclusive <laughs> conversation and club is uh, is reaching out through Chris through this this Easter egg in this podcast. So yeah, maybe yeah. that's our new thing. We start dropping like key yeah, little exactly. bonuses or coupon codes for certain things at strategic points. <laughs> if you can get through that, like you know Kelly's monologue for ten <laughs> minutes or her screeching, you get a prize. <laughs> exactly, you get into the most exclusive group in North America. <laughs> Oh, uh, awesome. Well, awesome. great, well, great conversation. So. Yeah. We'll continue part two on. Um, and uh, yeah, look forward to kind of picking your brain on the, the rest of the insights here, Chris. Perfect. Yeah, looking forward to it. Thanks. Thanks for having me on the session. Of course. Great. Of course. Hi. Nice chat. Yes, as always, number Kelly. two. Coming to you. <laughs> okay. Bye, guys. Sounds good. Thanks, guys.